Thank you, thank you. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody. I wanna thank you for spending the next hour with uh, Mike and I uh, to review Ditex Surge Protection. I'm Cheryl Darenthal, one of Ditex Field Sales Engineers. And I've been in the industry a little over 12 years now, starting with ADI and the last six being with Ditex. Mike Molinari um, is also with us and he is our Director of Marketing and has seen just about everything related to Surge in his 18 years with Ditex. We appreciate the invitation to present to you all today and to be your guides into the exciting world of surge protection. Ditech has led the industry in the design and manufacturing of surge protection solutions for over 32 years now. Ditech is located in sunny Largo, Florida, and we're a veteran owned and family operated company. We're an ISO 9001, 2015 certified manufacturer. We make roughly 95% of our products in this very building. And we've been on Tampa Bay's top 100 workplaces since 2011. And we've actually been the top 10 the past few years. This speaks a lot to the culture of Ditech and the family that we work for. Here's our manufacturing floor in action, which continues to grow and develop as our product offering does. We frequently, under normal circumstances, host visitors here so that way you can see the process and the quality that goes into our products. Everything that we do from board to packaging and all of the quality testing in between. So what are surges and spikes? Surges and spikes are defined as increases in current or voltage in an electrical circuit. They can be pre present on any metallic conductor and they can damage, degrade, or destroy your electronics. There are multiple causes of surges and spikes. Let's talk about external causes first though. A lot of people immediately think of direct lightning strikes because they're the most obvious and dramatic, but they are not the most common. See, direct lightning strikes actually only account for about 2% of equipment damage when you're talking about surges. What happens more often than not is the effect from a proximity strike. See, when the lightning hits the ground, that energy will travel a half mile or more depending on the soil conditions. That is the surge energy most commonly picked up on buried cables causing lightning damage. A recent Carnegie Mellon study showed that 33% of US businesses suffered lightning losses. That's more than floods, fires, hurricanes, earthquakes, and violence. You also have surges that come from the power company itself by way of utility grid switching. This is when the power company or your local co-op switches from residential to commercial areas back and forth to provide for peak performance times. That's generating surges that are coming into a facility through the incoming power. And then there are brownouts and blackouts. Anytime there's a sag in voltage from a brownout or a blackout, it's immediately followed by a spike, which is considered a surge. Internal causes can be just as damaging. Inductive load is when high power equipment like air conditioners, chillers, copiers, printers, elevators turn on. That power dissipates within the facility causing surges to reach internal systems. These are actually the most common cause of surge events that a, a facility will experience. It's no, by no means as dramatic as lightning strikes, but it does happen more often. Think of inductive loads as silent killers degrading your electronic systems. You also have mechanical failures, which happens as equipment fails. Anything that happens upstream will have effects downstream. And as much as we like to think it doesn't happen, you have human error. It has happened where a field technician has mistakenly induced the wrong voltage or somehow crossed wires um, that will result in a surge. This by Solid map shows a nine year average of cloud to ground lightning strikes per square mile per year. So while we at Ditech sit here in Florida with an average of 20 to 28 strikes per square mile per year, you'll notice that there are actually many areas throughout the US that experience a lot of lightning. And all it takes is one good strike to take out an unprotected system. So now think about how that energy travels in the ground per flash and the surges coming from the utilities and you can see how important it is to protect your systems. 
The effects of these surges and spikes are the three Ds. Degradation is the gradual deterioration of electronic circuitry. This is more from your inductive loads or smaller surges that are kind of chipping away at your equipment until it fails one day out of the blue and you're wondering why it didn't last you more than 18 months. It's like jabs in a boxing match that it's wearing the other boxer out. Destruction is the instantaneous loss of expensive equipment. So anyone doing a camera or access control system, for example, has probably seen and smelled the circuit board and the char marks from a surge or a spike. That's the knockout punch. And then the most costly can actually be downtime. Um, this is the cost above and beyond uh, the cost of replacing your equipment. A real world example of this would be a hotel chain here located in Florida. Um, the surge protection on site was not quite as adequate or up to date as it could have been. And when lightning struck the restaurant across the street from this hotel, it ended up taking out his fire alarm system. He ended up having to park a truck in front of his building or his hotel for 17 days at $150 an hour. So he had the cost of downtime or the fire watch in addition to the cost of replacing his entire fire alarm system. This is a demonstration of how surge protection works using a PoE camera as a reference. So you have a cat cable going to your outdoor device here. If a surge is picked up on that cable, it's gonna go directly to your equipment. But if you have surge protection installed, that surge is dumped to ground before it can reach your equipment. There are three components used inside surge protection, either individually or combined for maximum performance. Here you've got thermally protected MOVs or TP mobs. They're most commonly used in AC power uh, protective devices or SPDs. They have a high surge current rating and they are a much safer option now because they have an uh, internal disconnect inside the MOV in the case of any kind of thermal overrun. The downside to these is that they do degrade after each surge that they shunt to ground. So anytime you have a AC surge protector in place for an extended period of time, a few years, you know, if you see something that's over five or more years, you'll have to consider that they have degraded each surge that they've taken and you might wanna replace it and start fresh. Another component is the silicon avalanche diode or SAD. These are ideal in low voltage and high speed data applications. They react very quickly and they have a superior voltage clamping performance. However, they don't have a, a high surge current handling. So a lot of times these are coupled with gas discharge tubes. These have a slow reaction time, but they have a high surge current handling capability. So when you combine the SADs with the GDTs, you've got the best of both worlds. A lot of surge protection requirements are code driven. NFPA 72 and 70 typically deal with building to building runs and the requirements for UL listed surge protectors. So here we've got uh, NFPA 72 2013 for fire alarm code. 12.2.4.2 states that all non-power limited and power limited signaling system circuits entering a building shall be provided with transient protection. NFPA 70 states, you got 695.14 states, a listed surge protection device shall be installed in or on the fire pump controller. 760.32, says that non-power limited fire alarm circuits and power limited fire alarm circuits that extend beyond one building and run outdoors shall meet the installation requirements of parts two, three, and four of article 800 and shall meet the installation requirements of part one of article 300. So basically it is required by code that surge protection be, list, be installed on these systems. An example of a surge protective device suitable to provide protection on um, the, the power limited and non-power limited would be our data protectors, which are UL497B listed. Protectors for data communications. This is an example of our surge protection refusal form. Now, 
I have this in a Word document that I'll typically share with my integrators so that way they can customize it with their own company logo and their own terms. But there's two purposes of this uh, surge refusal form. One, it's a great way um, to introduce what surges are and that surge protection is available. So it's a great educational tool. You can explain where surges come from, that surge protection is available on many different systems and it can actually uh, prevent or mitigate any damage in the future. Now, if your integrator or your end user decides that they don't want to include surge protection, you should have them sign off that they refused it. This actually protects the integrator because mm -hmm. more than likely, you know, there's a lot of turnover in companies and if you install a surge system, and a couple years later, they suffer surge damage, they might try to point the finger at you saying that you didn't protect them. Having this surge refusal form with somebody's signature on it protects you from, from them trying to point the finger, basically. I know I've seen a lot of um, checks trying to be um, written, <laughs> I guess is one way to put it. Anyway, um, it's a great tool, and I can customize this with your own uh, company or in words you can customize it. The applications that DITEC cover include surveillance, IT networks, access control, fire, HVAC, exterior lighting, and electrical distribution systems, both residential and commercial. Basically, if it has a copper conductor, there's a good chance we have a surge protector for it. Let's start with IP video surge protection. This slide shows you the surge options that we have to protect an IP PoE system. Something to keep in mind with these products is that they work with all camera and access wireless access systems. These devices will pass 10 gigs as well as high watt PoE power. You never have a loss of video or frame rate or a loss of data or packets unless the surge protector has been compromised. They're completely passive to the circuit and only react when there's an overvoltage on the line. Then they dump that energy to ground and reset for the next event. They are self-resetting, self-restoring until the components have been exhausted. And that's when you're gonna have a loss of video uh, or data causing you to troubleshoot. A common question that we get is why do you need to protect both ends of a cable run? The most vulnerable systems or devices are the ones that run building to building or to a remote pole. So here we're looking at a pole mounted camera as an example. When a lightning hits the ground nearby, that puts a lot of voltage into the ground, which can be picked up on that buried cable. That surge can go in either direction seeking ground and you don't know if it's gonna hit the camera or hit your head end. Best practice is to protect both ends as the surge protection protects the equipment where it is installed. The newest rack mount head and protectors are the DITEC uh, DTK RM Net S series. So this is available in 12, 16, and 24 channels pre-populated, and it's scalable from 12 channels to 24 in one rack space. Another really cool feature and probably the most appreciated feature by integrators I've talked to is the hot swappable modules. See, each channel is individually protected. If one channel is compromised, you're replacing a $60 or $70 surge module instead of a couple hundred or thousand dollar switch. You simply replace this module like an edge card. If a surge module ever needs to be replaced, it is just as simple as opening up the bezel from underneath and from the top, and then you just simply slide the unit out. Disconnect your circuit, and then replace it with a new one. Just as simple as that. Just as simple as that. The little brother in the NetS series is the wall mount option. So these are available in four and eight channels, which are great for smaller applications or for IDF cabinets in the field. The modules in the wall mount and the rack mounts are the same, so it's easy to stock replacement modules for service. Now we do have two different versions that you need to be aware of. 
If you have a scenario where you're using a Veracity, Altronics, or an NVT long range extender where you're utilizing 56 volts or changing the PoE protocol through a transceiver and receiver, then you'll need the EXTS version. You can get these modules separately, or you can order the wall or rack mounts in the EXTS version specifically for use with extenders. So the difference is the clamping voltage pen to pen. The EXTS version will allow more power pen to pen for use with extenders, while the Net S series has a tighter clamp pen to pen for your traditional um, IP or PoE system. Fire alarm protection is pretty straightforward, and as I mentioned, it is code driven. As with video, our fire alarm surge protectors will work with all fire alarm systems. So starting on the left, all SLC, IDC, PIV, and NAC circuits that enter and exit a building are required to have surge protection by code. We offer the 2MHLP series, which are three stage hybrid devices featuring a diode, gas discharge tube, and fuse. The F version is for the SLC or any circuit under one amp. If the F version self-sacrifices, it opens the circuit. This makes troubleshooting much easier in a multi-building campus or a garden-style apartment setting. The B version now handles up to five amps and would be used um, on your NACs. And when this is compromised, it's going to short to ground. On the right, you'll see that any external antenna on your GSM or radio would use our VSPN surge protector and any POTS line still in use would be protected by our MRJ 31X SCP WP or terminal style 2MH TP WB with a replaceable surge module. On the bottom here is where we've come a long way. The DTK 120HW is still one of our top three selling devices. It's a strong UL listed type one parallel surge protector at a great price point. The drawback to passive parallel protection is that the LED indicator light is on when it's working and it's off when it's not. It requires regular inspection to know if your protection is still good. So how can we prevent any false sense of protection? Meet the deflector. This groundbreaking patented technology is a 120 volt 20 amp surge protector with EMI RFI filtering. It has green LED indicator lights letting you know that you have power, that you are grounded and are protected. If the deflector is compromised, there is a flashing red LED and most importantly, an audible alarm letting the end user know instantly that they need to replace their surge protection. Now here's the other really innovative feature. The protection is in a replaceable module. And that's it. You're now able to replace a surge module in a matter of minutes. You no longer have to call an electrician to replace your 120 volt surge protector for you either. And in some instances, you can even sell the end user a spare module if you trust them or if they do their own maintenance work or if they've got somebody on hand that, that can um, handle this for you. In addition to instant notification, there is a normally open, normally closed dry contact inside to provide remote notification. So now you have visual, audible, and smart notifications. The DTK 120HW LOK is our 120HW with a fire alarm label and an NFPA 72 compliant cir circuit breaker lock. Buying these together makes sense because you need these um, on your systems to pass any inspection.
The TSS series here gives you a combination of surge protection in their own enclosures. So these make for a really clean install and it helps reduce any kind of installation errors. And this line is actually about to grow with a fully modular version as well. So keep an eye out. In our networking and communication surge protection line, we have the Versa module series, which allows you to mix and match different technologies in a rack mount or a wall mount faceplate. So you can buy network, PoE, analog surge protection, and mix and match them all in the faceplate there and have a single ground point. You also have the CAT6A series, which is for UL497A primary protection. And we have two UPS series. Here's a typical network installation without surge protection. The more smart devices, the more smart your devices get and the more they integrate, the more at risk your internal systems are. With proper protection on your outdoor devices and at the head end switches, your internal infrastructures will be protected those internal infrastructures being your server, your workstations, your phones, your printers, things that you wouldn't think would be at risk for surge damage until outdoor devices get introduced to those switches. Ditec has online double conversion UPSs now. They're available in 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, and 3,000 BA and are rack or tower mount. Online double conversion means your connected equipment is always running on clean battery power. There is zero transfer time if the power were to go out. This is ideal with critical infrastructure or servers where you can't afford any kind of delay in power switching. One of the key differences with Ditex UPSs are that we include the Ethernet SNMP card as well as the rack rails, so you don't have to purchase these as accessories or separately. The SNMP card allows you to remotely monitor and receive notifications of the event log. You can remotely control the programmable outlets, or you could even power this, the cycle the power on the entire UPS unit altogether. We also offer line interactive UPSs and 600 and 800 BA. These are compact, full of features, and are a phenomenal price. They have a touchscreen LCD that when you press tells you the power in, the power out, the load status, and the battery health right there on the unit. They also have a voltage stabilizer that will boost or buck your power to keep you right around 120. Here we have an access control protection system or diagram. So similar to fire, you want to protect the power, whether it's AC transformer power or POE, as well as the communication circuits. In this case, it'll be Wigan, Clock and Data, or OSDP. We also have um, our ESSs, which will protect your mag locks or your door strikes. In gate access systems, you need to protect the power to the gate motor, the safety and exit loops that are buried in the ground, and the communication circuits to the reader or to the telephone entry system. Protection on an intrusion system would include the power, any outdoor circuit like an outdoor motion or a photo beam that ties into that panel, and the phone line if it's being used. Ditec also offers a full line of AC power protection. But for today, I would just like to point out our residential, typical residential protectors. So your first line of defense is protecting the power coming in at the electrical panel or the meter. You'll also want to protect the HVAC condenser or a pool pump or a well pump as those cables exit the house. And then don't forget the incoming cable needs to be protected. You can do that uh, with our VSPN or you can use an Ethernet surge protector on the other side of that modem. And then we've got point of use surge protection as well, little uh, three outlet or seven outlet receptacle protectors or a single outlet even. Here are the most common whole house panel options. You've got the DTK-120-240HD, 
for your most common panel, residential panel. The DTK 120-240HD2 would be a more robust version or handle a bigger sized panel. The D50CM is ideal for meters. And the DTK 120-240CM Plus is a very versatile surge protector for your HVAC condenser, your pull pump, your well pump. And now Mike's gonna tell you about best practices. I am here. That's going to be a tough act to follow. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, let's see. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And uh, let's go here. And everyone should see best practices. So with that being said, let me get started. So thank you, Cheryl, for walking us through the shocking world of surge protection and the, the right parts to use. And now we get to the part of the presentation. Uh, which concerns the implementation of those parts. And a surge protector is only as good as the install. And unfortunately, once we send the product out of our factory doors here, uh, we hope and pray that people read the install instructions, but unfortunately, sometimes those make their way onto the truck floor. And the surge protector doesn't get installed properly and therefore doesn't do its job. So we're gonna go through about 37 rules today. Um, that's just a joke, there's only five of them. So without, without further ado, we'll get to the uh, first one, which is gonna be installation rule number one. And we call this our three foot rule. Now, this has to do with the amount of conductor between the surge protector and what you're protecting. And this is gonna cover a series wired surge protector. So a device that has an in and an out and then connects to your camera or your device on an SLC etc cetera, etc cetera. so the minimum amount of wire distance we want to see is three feet uh, it can be a little longer than that four five six feet however you don't want to be shorter than three foot and there's a very specific reason now if you have a installation where there's a nice short little uh, patch cord between the device you're protecting and the surge protector what happens is the device doesn't have quite enough time to react to the surge and dump it safely to ground. Now, even though these devices react in the manner of a few nanoseconds, which is a billionth of a second, they still require some reaction time to grab that energy and dump it to ground. If you don't build up enough buffer in that equation, that energy could potentially be into the protected equipment before the device, the surge protector turns on and shunts it to ground. So you can see in the example on the left, a very, very, very short patch cable. I'm not sure I've ever seen one like that, but uh, somebody took a lot of time and effort to make a, a little jumper um, versus the correct implementation on the right where you have the MRJ POEs on the left side of that box and plenty of conductor length between those devices and the neck gear switch up in the top right-hand corner. So those devices have plenty of time to react dissipate that energy to ground. So again, the minimum is three feet. That's not physically three feet away. We wanna see three feet of wire distance. Okay, installation rule number two. This has to do with the use of a grounding bus bar and not using twist on wire connectors, AKA wire nuts. And a lot of times when we review this installation rule, anybody who's been doing security or electrical installs in the field for many years kind of look at us funny because wire nuts are used uh, darn near every day. But when you're dealing with surge protection and specifically surge protection ground wires, the last thing you want to do is create a high resistance connection for a path you're trying to dump a lot of surge down. And where I'm going with that is you can think of the flow of electrons on copper like the flow of water in a pipe. Water doesn't like to make sharp bends. Um, and this is kind of akin to having a hose and you're washing your vehicle and one of the kids comes up, plays a prank on you and kinks the water hose. What happens to all the water pressure? It all backs up at that junction. Well, what you see in a connection here in the incorrect example is four wires jammed up under a wire nut essentially kinking the hose. Now, is there continuity there? Yes, but when you're trying to dump two or 3,000 volts of energy down a grounding path, the last thing we want to do is have a kink in the hose. So the correct implementation of tying your grounds together is by using a grounding bus bar. Now, these are available. We sell them, obviously sell them through ADI. Uh, some of you have probably seen one once or twice, 
uh, very easy to obtain. This is how you want to bond your surge protection ground wires together. And you'll notice there are no kinks in that pipe. So that surge protector can now dump to that grounding bus bar and it has an even larger drain wire by the way of a larger gauge wire to drain that energy out of the system safely and efficiently. And that is the name of the game, to get that energy away from the equipment safely to earth ground as quickly and efficiently as possible. So installation rule number three. Now this one's tough to uh, kind of cover because this installation right here uh, does look good. This is correct. But what we see a lot is multiple surge protectors in a trough or a junction box that are all tied together via a daisy chain. And what I mean by that is that the installer or the technician took the ground and went from one surge protector to another, to another, and down the line. And what you'll notice there is they have each connection point on the surge protector, then through a wire nut, and then ultimately to your ground. Now, this wasn't due to any type of laziness factor. It was just due to an education factor because the same amount of labor would have been involved to just go ahead and run the ground wire from the surge protector directly to the grounding bus, not through four other surge protectors. So you never want to daisy chain them together because number one, you're creating resistance every time you cut that wire and terminate it to another grounding screw. And if any of those grounding screws in that incorrect example come loose, you basically have lost the ground for all the surge protectors behind that. So best practice dictates that when you have multiple surge protectors in an enclosure, you want to make sure that each ground is a dedicated run to the grounding bus bar. So that's installation rule number three. Installation rule number four has to do with occupying the same conduit when you're entering and leaving a surge protection enclosure. And what you want to do is always keep your unprotected wires, which is your field wiring, separated from your protected wires, which is your wiring to your protected equipment. And the reason for this is an effect called inductive coupling. And for the fire alarm guys, it would be the same reason why you don't run 120 volt and SLC in the same pipe. It's because energy can actually couple over to the other wires, creating an instance where the surge is actually bypassed and the energy still gets into the system. So in the example here, the installer decided to put a 120 volt series wired surge protector inside a junction box, but they utilize the same conduit to enter and leave that box. So now what has occurred is you have six number 12 wires jammed into a conduit. So before the surge protector even has a chance to dissipate that energy to ground, that energy could potentially arc over in that conduit and still take out the fire alarm panel to the right of it. So the correct way to implement that type of scenario or any type of scenario where you have surge protection in an enclosure is you wanna enter and leave separate conduits. Make sure your protected wires are isolated from your unprotected wires. Okay, rule number five, um, whenever possible, we wanna make sure that uh, surge protectors are never installed within the equipment itself. If you have the means and you have the space, go ahead and put them in their own junction box. So a lot of installs, um, we even see them on LinkedIn now uh, in our news feeds where somebody will post a picture of a horrible surge install and a lot, some of them look like this where uh, somebody thought it would be a good idea to turn this fire alarm panel into a jack in the box and just jam everything in there. So the next guy that has to open it uh, gets to see the rat's nest that pops out at them. So the, the issue here is not so much the performance of the surge protector, it's the sense that uh, if this device does take a catastrophic hit, there, there could be some residual physical damage, which means that there might be some damage to wiring and the circuit boards inside. So when you have the real estate, this, it's not really the, the right um, approach here to install surge protection inside the panel. You want to make sure it's installed inside a enclosure adjacent to what you're protecting. Much cleaner install, much easier to meet your three foot length requirements, as well as your grounding, your no daisy chaining and utilizing your grounding bus bar. Now you might be asking, well, what kind of enclosure do I use? Any UL listed electrically rated enclosure is gonna be fine for this application. Now, if you all paid attention on the first slide when I said series wired surge protectors have the three foot rule, that is specific to 
surge protectors with in and out. But I wanna specifically cover the DTK 120HW as it still is in our 32nd year of business, our most popular selling part. Now this is a parallel wired surge protector. So the three foot rule can become a bit confusing because we give you 24 inches of wire coming out of the HW and you might be saying, well, if you're requiring me to have three feet, you've only given me two feet of wire. Well, that's not the same as a series wired surge protector. Since these are wired in parallel, best practice would dictate that you cut down those leads as short as possible, tie them to your junction, your connection point, which can be a terminal strip, and then from the terminal strip, to the protected equipment is where you're gonna have your three foot buffer, okay? So the diagram is hopefully guiding you with that visual of what we wanna see with an HW. Now, you can install them at the fire alarm panel if your local jurisdiction allows you to put a terminal strip inside the panel for this means. You can install them inside a junction box in line with the um, EMT. Uh, this is the most preferred method because you definitely get your three foot of wire distance. It's very easy to see the green light on the LE, on the uh, HW and it's much easier to service this uh, if it has its own junction box. Last but not least, you can install them at the house panel, um, right on the load side of the 20 amp breaker that's feeding the fire alarm control panel. So any one of those three areas are absolutely okay to install a 120HW. These three diagrams are in the HW installation guide that comes with every product. I'd encourage you, if you are utilizing that product, go ahead and read those notes, look at the diagrams. If you have questions, you can always reach out to Dietech and we'll, we'll, ask, we'll answer those for you. So a couple installation photos here. This is a nice install of the RM24 Net S that Cheryl had showed earlier, the actual video. This is a real world uh, scenario where it's protecting a Cisco switch. Here's an outdoor um, setup, uh, just kind of showing you the MRJ POES, how it would be implemented in there, how much real estate it takes, um, you know, obviously how you would ground it. And then, uh, a TSS-1 here by a Siemens panel. Um, if anybody's not a Siemens pan, please don't, uh, fan, please don't throw tomatoes at the screen. This is just an example picture of the Ditec. Uh, very nice install to do it in an enclosure outside. We do provide that enclosure as a part number so you don't have to go shopping for your own. Makes for a much cleaner install and makes it much easier to follow best practice. So this is a picture of a custom enclosure that uh, one of the school boards in Florida did here. They utilized the 2MHLP product, ran the ground wires directly to the bus, didn't daisy chain, left and um, entered different conduits. Very, very good looking install here. Here's a, a couple of the, actually four of the DTK 120 SRDs installed in an enclosure. Again, you guys are probably seeing the theme here of what Ditech wants to see with the, with the field installs. Here's an application where got our one of our UPS uh, 1000Rs at the very bottom there, and then a whole slew of 2MHLP modules uh, at the top. And that I think looks like about, uh, I'd say about 55 um, MHLP. So those are all five position bases, uh, basically loaded with five uh, modules each. So quite a large install there for low voltage circuits. Here's a close-up of some of the LVLP products. Again, towel tied to a uh, dedicated grounding bus. And then here's a electrical install with the Zeus series, what it looks like on the outside of a building. Each disconnect, each panel has a surge protector on it. So now we're gonna move into the grounding and bonding section, and we're gonna give you guys some, uh, some guidance on what to look for, what types of ground that Ditech wants to see in the field for optimal performance how to measure that and what to use as, as your grounding means. So with ground resistance, um, NEC calls out and recommends uh, 25 ohms or less for a single electrode. Uh, if that number is not met, the code dictates that a supplemental grounding rod needs to be placed um, basically adjacent to that ground. Once that's done, the electrician can walk away. No further measurement is required. So there are no grounding police that are going out there and looking for 25 ohms or less. The IEEE Green Book does recommend between half an ohm and five ohms for optimal building harmonics. And I can tell you with surge protection, the lower ground resistance, the better the performance. So, and you can see the two different readings here. 
Uh, we had a 1.61 ohms on one site, 82.7 ohms. Definitely needs improvement. Your surge protection is really going to suffer once you start to creep up above that 25 ohm limit. Now, how do we measure it? We use two different types of tools. One is a earth ground resistance clamp meter, which uh, the one model we use is made by Ideal. This allows you to clamp right around the grounding electrode or the, um, or the grounding conductor, and it will give you a digital reading of what your resistance is to earth ground. This is not the same as taking your Klein or Fluke multimeter with your probes and measuring a ground wire. That's not what we're doing here. This is doing a very complex mathematical equation in there, inducing some, uh, some voltage onto that uh, and frequency onto that ground and coming back with a measurement. It's about a $1,500 to $1,600 meter. So it's definitely not doing the same thing as your multimeter would. Uh, very useful tool for diagnosing surge problems because if you don't have a good ground, the surge protection is not really gonna function as intended. Now, another method that we, uh, we use here is a fall of potential, and the brand we go with is Megger. Now, the challenge here is the grounding rod has to be disconnected from any electrical service. So if you're trying to measure the ground um, at your switch gear or your main building, this would not be the tool to use. This would be for an instance, if you are out in the field somewhere and you have no ground for your surge protector and you had to drive a ground rod, this would be the way to measure that because the digital unit cannot measure a standalone ground rod. The fall of potential, you cannot measure a ground rod that is currently hooked up to an electrical service. So two different types of tools for two scenarios. Now, grounding reference points. We start with a concrete encased electrode, which is a Eufor bond. Uh, that's where all the rebar and everything is in the concrete. That's a very, very good uh, uh, ground for multiple soil conditions. You have the metal building frame. Obviously, you want to make sure nothing's painted before you tie into the metal building, building frame. We've seen a lot of instances where uh, somebody put a sheet metal screw right into a metal frame and forgot to scratch the paint away. So paint is not a very good conductor. It's a good insulator. So make sure you, uh, you've got metal to metal contact. Rod and pipe electrodes, those are going to be your grounding rods, plate electrodes as well, and then finally electrical distribution ground. So you'll notice some of our products like the deflector series utilizes the ground that's coming into the fire alarm panel for that. That is considered the electrical distribution ground. So your circuit grounding conductor can be used to dissipate energy too. And just make sure if you're dealing with multiple ground rods around a facility, you want to make sure they are bonded together. And that is covered in NEC Article 250.50. This is to eliminate any potential for a ground loop with differences in potential with two grounding points and having low voltage circuits connected between them. That means the ground will try to equalize through your camera feed or your fire alarm circuits. You have to have those tied together so they become an equal potential. You avoid the potential for a ground loop. Now, inspecting surge protection, you've seen some of the newer ways Ditech does it with audible alarms and um, notifying you intelligently. For some of the legacy products, the LED is there for a reason. If the LED on the AC power surge protector is out, that means it needs to be replaced. I would encourage all of you to make sure your maintenance managers, your operation techs are in the habit of looking at the surge protector LEDs whenever they can because I can assure you if a bad storm comes through, the surge goes out, does its job, and the LED is not getting checked, the next surge that comes through is gonna take out your equipment. For the low voltage protectors, it makes it much easier. We either short to ground or open the circuit depending on the model you're using. So you're not gonna get any power or data to pass through it. You're gonna have to go in your troubleshooting, go to the surge protector first, bypass it. If that circuit comes back up, you know for sure it was the surge protector that, that did its job. So we do have a web portal for anybody of an engineering type of um, uh, position. We have our unlocked data sheets on there, the design files, the A&E specs, the CAD drawings, technical white papers, application diagrams, you name it. Uh, somebody here at Ditech will send you an invitation if you're interested in becoming part of the web portal. Obviously, it doesn't cost anything. You just need your own specific login there. Very, very, very technical documents um, very, uh, of a very technical nature. Quite, quite a library there of any, everything and everything you needed to know about surge protection. So, Now, um, our contact information is here. Our website's www.ditechsurgeprotection.com. You can reach the sales team at the 800 number there. Uh, technical support is a different number, the 888 number. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show a 
rep map of uh, the entire US to show you the person here at DITEC that's responsible for the territory. But I'm gonna turn it over to Roman right now so he can speak a little bit and then uh, we can address any further questions after that. Roman, are you there? Yep, here I am. Let me go ahead and share. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I have a slide to, to put up. So okay. I'll wait until you're done, I guess. Well, you can go ahead and uh, you can go ahead and share now, and then I'll I'll grab it back if you'd like, and uh, I'll show everybody the map. There you go, that'll work. All right, I want to thank everyone for joining the webinar today. Um, thanks to Cheryl and Mike with DITEC. Uh, I am Roman Rusnick. I'm with the ADI IP Programming Center. And uh, the ADI systems team has, uh, let's get to the next slide here. There we go. Um, systems, we've been assisting ADI customers for over 25 years. Uh, the team of experts uh, are really here to help with all your project needs. Um, we have a dedicated team that provides recommendations for all the products we carry in the various categories within the low voltage security industry. Uh, you can contact the systems team by calling the toll free number or you can send an email with your requirements to request a quote. And let's see here. So several years ago, ADI created the IP programming team with locations in Louisville, Kentucky and Toronto, Canada. It started out with video surveillance, uh, where we upgrade the firmware, set the IP parameters for products like IP cameras. Uh, we've expanded into programming NVRs and servers, uh, intrusion systems, and we have the capability to program other products, uh, such as IP intercom systems. The benefits uh, include reducing on-site labor, um, by pre-programming the devices. And then that allows you to have your on-site technician simply mount the cameras, uh, maybe even sending out a, a lower level tech to, to save some labor. It also virtually eliminates out-of-box failures by inspecting the cameras for physical damage and checking for video. Uh, we also test the pan tilt zoom functions for PTZ cameras. Um, Cameras can then be uh, uh, the boxes or cameras can be labeled with whatever designation you want, such like camera numbers, camera location, IP address. And uh, this is just a, a view of some of the things. The center is uh, intrusion systems and then uh, cameras over on, the, on each side. But the uh, IP Programming Center stands ready to help your business reduce time and labor. And if you have questions, um, you can contact your local branch for more information. Uh, thanks. And let me go ahead and turn it back to um, Chris. Mike, it was close. Mike, sorry. <laughs> close enough. That's uh, fine. All right. Let's see here. I got gotcha. you. All right, so everybody should be, uh, let me see here. Everyone should see the screen of the rep map uh, for DITEC. We do have field sales engineers that travel 50% uh, of the time. Unfortunately, they're not traveling right now with everything going on, but hopefully when, uh, when things die down a little bit, uh, we can get out in the field and see you folks. Um, webinars are obviously available. So if you saw anything on this presentation today, you can contact your dedicated rep here at DITEC and we can schedule a webinar for you and your teams. Um, you know, if your state has to be, happens to be in a phase two or a phase three where you are allowing folks in, it's definitely something we can talk about. But there were a couple of good questions on the, uh, the presentation uh, that I, I'll go over. I don't know if um, everyone saw them in the Q&A box, but one person asked if the, the VSPN ex, uh, external antenna protector covered BDA donor antennas, it absolutely does. Uh, the frequency range is zero to four gigahertz. So it'll definitely cover your 800, 900 megahertz range, no problem. 
another gentleman had asked if um, they can run a ground to the camera enclosure that's mounted to the outside pole. Um, I would rather see the ground wire run from the surge protector to the grounding point, whether it be a grounding rod or an electrical distribution ground at the base of the pole, because if there's not good surface contact between the metallic bracket and the pole, that may cause the performance to suffer from a surge standpoint. So I'd recommend um, running a separate one there. Uh, and I think that is about it for the questions. Cheryl, do you have anything to add? She might still be muted. She is. Okay. I guess she doesn't have anything to add. Well, uh, with that uh, being said, hopefully everyone enjoyed. Yep, go ahead. No, I think, uh, I think we are available this one thing i do want to point out is that this map kind of shows you the um field reps but you guys also have dedicated inside sales reps so hopefully if you can grab a screenshot you'll have everybody's direct number um right now everyone's kind of uh, limited and traveling um but we can do a lot of troubleshooting with you over uh pictures so if you save everybody's email address in your area and your territory, you can start to troubleshoot a lot via email um, and conversations with pictures of, of installs too.